We are up to chapter 3 in the first John. And like I said before uh, a few minutes ago, that this has got some really interesting stuff that, again, we all knew, but I think it's going to find it that our understanding was really lacking because we miss one word. And it's so easy to miss one word. And with that one word, a whole host of other scriptures come to light. It's just amazing how God works in these ways. And um, I say, really, I, I, I hope that you all grasp at least that part as much as I have in, in preparing this. If you don't catch anything else, I want you to make sure you grasp that. Um, and we'll get to it here in a minute. But starting off with 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to do verses 1 through 10. And it's, I titled it, and I changed it from the title I had before because I, as I get a little better understanding, a distinct group, okay? And also, do you struggle with sin, and how is that a good thing and a comforting thing? Never thought, like, struggling with sin is a good thing? No. Yes, it is. Okay, we're, and we're going to see why. It's more than it's more than that. A whole lot more than that. Amazingly more than that. So starting off with verse one, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Okay, this is we're going to break this verse down. First part of it: see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. First of all, bestowed. That's to confer or to present. But it's bestowed, so it's in the past tense. So what he has done for us, what he has conferred on us, he has done in the past. Okay, so that's, now, how great is this love? And when we really stop and think that the creator of the universe, God Almighty himself, sent his son to die for us. To go through all that Jesus went through on behalf of the human race, there is no greater love. And we don't really grasp he is so much greater than us and he, that he was willing to do this. Because this was the way for him to bestow his love on a people. It was the only way. And that's the part that we sometimes don't really grasp is there were no other options for him to demonstrate his love to us than to, for Jesus to go through what he went through. We think of it as, well, we're, we're grateful for what Jesus did, but we don't really get to the depth of understanding of who did it. The who is a big deal. And it is God Almighty did this who has any options to do anything that he wants, has the ability to do anything he wants. And he chose this way because it was the best way and the only way. Because Jesus being God, first of all, there are things that God cannot do. And one of the things God cannot do is be untrue to himself. Okay? He has to be true to who he is. He can't vary from that. So when he said, you sin, you die, he couldn't come back and say, well, sort of, kind of. I'm just going to kind of pass that over. No, he can't do that. Because God cannot, like you said, lie. So he doesn't change his plans. He fulfills his plans. And his plans always bring glory to him. Continuing in verse 1. That we would be called children of God and such we are. We're that distinct group. We're a group in this world that is different from the world. This group 
and all of those like us all over the world are a very distinct group. And in comparison to overall population, we are a small group. We are a minority. It is not by any means the majority. But we are very distinct. And we are very distinct in the fact that this God, this Jesus, who demonstrated that greatness of us, of that love, calls us his children. So we are brought into a family. We are brought into a family that only exists because of what Jesus did. So we are part of a very distinct group of people. Throughout all of history, there has been only a small group throughout all the generations that have been part of this distinct family. So we're called his children. And then it says, and such we are, not such we will become, not down the road someday, we are now that distinct group, children of God Almighty. Continuing with verse 1, for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Reality is they just don't get it. You talk to people in the world about this salvation, about this Jesus, and most of them are actually fairly cordial and friendly about it, but you can tell it just is not sinking in. They really don't grasp it like we can. They don't see the reality of what it is like we do. And you can see that when you might say in the actions of people where they will think it is just utterly ridiculous when you don't do a certain thing because you have this religious belief. Well, that... On the news, it was interesting. There's some politic, I forget who it was, nor does it matter. That was talking about um, his religious beliefs. But his religious beliefs has absolutely no bearing on how he governs. What are your religious beliefs about? You can tell, they don't get it. If one is not controlling the other, the one or the other is meaningless. If we say we believe things and our actions don't demonstrate that, it doesn't, we don't believe it. It's utterly ridiculous, but the world doesn't get it. They can't possibly think that somebody would do something out of conviction. And you can hear that, and you, and you can follow the news and you can see that happening over and over again in the world, and you can do dealing with people, you can see it happening. They can't understand why wouldn't you do this because you will receive a immediate benefit of some sort, and that is the, what is driving you. You say, no, what's driving me is the Word of God. That's what's guiding me. I don't vary from that. I don't change it, because, change what I believe. I, my convictions are my convictions, and they are not for sale. Because otherwise you can't call them convictions anymore. There's an old saying, none are so blind as those who will not see. And that's the blindness that's on this world there is a blindness because they're not willing to see. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God and it, has, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Okay, we're going to break that one down too. Behold, we are now we are children of God okay in verse Peter 2 verse 10 explains that a little more for you once were not a people but now you are a people of God but now you are the people of God you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy okay we started off in a sinful state but then we received mercy and that changed who we were. It changes who we are. Because we have now received that mercy. 
mercy kind of an interesting word it's something that really isn't deserved it's not earned somebody can give it we can't demand it it has to be given and it has to be given voluntarily otherwise it's not mercy continuing with verse 2 and it has not appeared as yet what we will be 1 Corinthians 15 does a pretty good job of explaining some of these things without it gives us hints but very little details but someone will say how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come you fool that which is sown does not come to life unless it dies and that which you sow you do not sow the body which is to be but a bare grain perhaps of wheat or something else but God gives it a body just as he wishes and to each of the seed a body of its own in other words what Paul is explaining here is that our body is kind of the seed and so the, the new body will not be what we have now, but it will be something much greater. Because you plant a kernel of wheat, a kernel of corn, um, whatever seed, it doesn't produce a bigger seed. That's not what you get. You get a whole plant with all of the uniqueness of that plant. In the same manner, Paul is telling us that what we have now is the seed. What we will become is something much greater. Now, why doesn't the scripture ever explain what that something greater is? For the same reason it doesn't explain to us in detail what heaven is. Because of the fact it's beyond our comprehension to understand it. It is much greater than what our minds could even wrap ourselves around. This glorified body, physically, it might look the same, but it's going to be totally different. And we know that from when Jesus arose from the dead and his appearing and disappearing and his way of mode of travel, all these things were so different. But he still was recognized by his disciples. So they still saw the form of the same man that they saw before. But his, who he was, had really radically changed and his physical human side of him had changed considerably. Continuing on with verse two. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 continues on. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now there's a whole bunch there, but it, here again, it doesn't precisely lay out a bunch of details, but it gives us a bunch of hints. Okay, it was sown imperishable. It's raised imperishable. In other words, there's no longer, that, that new body doesn't die. It doesn't get old. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't have all these things. That's gone. Gone away with. It's sown in dishonor. Well, our bodies are dishonor. Well, yeah, we're kind of modest on how we demonstrate and show our bodies. Okay? We're raised with all, that's gone. Okay? It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. We are weak. Physically, but most importantly, mentally. Mentally, we are very weak. Compared to, because we stop and think about all the knowledge in the universe. Okay? And how much of that knowledge would you say that you have obtained? and you take the knowledge and you take a piece of pie and that's all the knowledge in the universe um, how big is your slice every one of us will agree it is really really tiny okay yeah it's I mean, yeah, it's oh, it would be almost invisible but let's face it uh, and I don't care how big that pie is um, so we understand that weakness that mental weakness that's there but it's raised in power 
And that power is not just, again, physical, but it's also mental. Whereas Paul also talks about that, uh, you know, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall understand fully, even as we are fully understood. So if we understand ourselves as well as God understands us, that's a huge increase in knowledge just in that one little thing. So it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. That, I think, is really beyond what we can grasp. Just that line alone. Because of the fact that we are so used to a physical body, but can you imagine that the physical body and the spiritual body are one and the same? I can't. Maybe you can. But it says where there is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. We can know we know we have a spirit within us, but they're almost like they're separate. They're there, but they're separate, and that ends and becomes a oneness. Verse three, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Okay. We have that hope, we have that assurance, and this hope again is not a hope, I hope so, it is a hope of assurance, right? Fixes his hope on him. So we fix our hope, our assurance, on what Christ did for us. That our total dependence, as far as our salvation is concerned, is fixed steadfastly on what Jesus did for us. Bottom line has to be that. If we don't have that, all the rest of it becomes meaningless. But if we have that, purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, we become pure without any fault. Just as Jesus himself was without fault. Now, I said, well, wait a minute. I haven't quite obtained to that yet. Let's continue on and we're going to see I mean like I said I found some really cool stuff as far as depth of understanding of a whole host of things and we're about to get there continuing with verse 4 everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness keyword practice and all the rest of what we're going to look at don't forget practice because practice is the key to understanding the rest of this and even back what we've been looking at. That whole thing of practice is the key. Because we're gonna find ourselves in the midst of controversy, conundrums, I guess is probably the best word, because it doesn't fit unless we remember practice. Okay. Practice. What are practices? Habits of my life. What is lawlessness? Having my own laws, not God's. And then Aristotle had a really good line. He says, we are what we repeatedly do. That's who we are. What do we do over and over again? What, what things define us by our actions of what we do? That defines who we are. It's that practice of who we are. Verse 5, and you know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Okay, we know this. We know that he appeared, that he came, he died, he rose again to take away our sins. We know that. We accept that. That's where all of our hope is placed. That's where all of our assurance is placed. Because he was sinless, maintained sinless, stayed sinless, was still a man without sin, which none of us are, until we put our hope in him. Verse 6, here's one of those difficult ones. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Wait a minute now, I got a problem here. I mean, I say I abide in him, my hope is in him, my trust is in him, and here John is saying that no one who abides in him sins. I say, but I know I do. I know I have that problem. 
how in the world can he say that? Because if that, just that standalone is true, I have no hope. Because obviously I'm not abiding in him because I sin. Don't forget practice. We're going to get back to it. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. In other words, if I have sin, I've never even understood. I've never known anything about who he is. Don't worry. We're going to get there. 1 John 1, verse 8, which we looked at a number of weeks back. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. <laughs> well, now we really have a pickle to be a get out of, don't we? Okay, if we abide in him, we have no sin. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar. Don't forget practice. I'll get to it. Don't worry. Verses 7 and 8a. Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. The one that who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Here's our key. Remember practice. I said it was really, really important to remember practice because it changes the way we see all of this. It is, who is it that sins? Well, we all sin. We know that. But do we practice sin? Is this our nature of who we are, how we live, or have we turned our lives over to Christ? We have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and now when I do sin, it bothers me. Where before when I would sin, it didn't bother me. But because it bothers me, I'm going to try to change it. So I'm going to practice not sinning. If I don't have him, I'm going to practice sinning. So that whole word practice changes the way we see all of it. It is no longer a case of do I sin or don't I sin. That's not the question. The question is, do I practice it? Am I continually going down that path of sin that I know is sin and it doesn't bother me? Then I don't have the Spirit of God in me. But if it bothers me, then I do. And I have a joy and a comfort in knowing that sin bothers me. Because it proves that Christ is in me. Do you see how it totally changes the way we see these verses? No longer are we looking at them from the standpoint, oh yeah, I know I sin, I know I sin. And there's no hope. Oh yeah, the sins have all been taken away, they're all forgiven, I know that. So I'm not charged with any sin, but until I sin. Do I practice sin? Or do I practice righteousness? Who am I? Here's a way I can look at my own life, at my own heart, at my own spirit, and receive comfort, knowing that sin bothers me. That I don't like it. I want to stop it. Verse 8b, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Because it was Satan himself who brought this sin in. It was Satan himself who has been perpetuating all of these lies throughout all of history and they continue. But when Jesus came, he won that victory. Now we don't, the, the war is won, but the battle rages on. But the war has been won. Because he came to destroy that evil that Satan had brought into this world. He brought it in for, he changed who we are. He took out this distinct group, which, which we are part of. And he has removed that power that Satan had over us. Satan has no control over us. He can still tempt us. He can still lie to us. He can still lead us. 
but he doesn't control us. He can only control us as far as we permit and as far as God permits. Remember Job. Okay, it wasn't Job who was doing anything wrong. It was God permitted these things to happen. But in the midst of that permission, God was always there and his love was always there. So, why? That really brings that huge question of why did God create this world? Why did God permit sin to come into this world? Why did God decide to send his son to die to pay for the sins of this world? I mean, these are big questions. But they all have an answer. There actually are answers to these big questions. See, God would not have a people that chose to love him if they didn't have a choice. You have to have a choice. Because if there is no choice, if there are no options, then it can't be true. Love cannot be true unless it's voluntary choice. So that voluntary choice had to be available and in which there would not be uh, you must say anything forcing it. It's not that he chose us before we chose him. You got here again, you got those whole election and free will thing going on. But the reality of it is that God, in his infinite wisdom, wanted a people that would choose to love him because they wanted to. That's what he did beginning. That's why all creation. And that's why, actually, the fall was necessary. Because if the fall didn't take place, he would not have been able to fulfill his whole concept of a people that chose to love him. <coughs> they would do it because they were created that way. Robots. Right. And God said, no, I am going to demonstrate my greatness, my glory, by creating a people with a choice. And this people are going to choose me because they want to. And that brings the highest glory. And all of God's purposes bring him the highest glory. That's, what, that's all part of who he is. So without the choice, there isn't the love. So you had to have all of these things take place. But then because of the fact that we are weak in our human bodies... He had to provide a way for us to get out of this dilemma that we were in, and that's where Jesus came in. Here's where God demonstrated that greatness of his love for us. And this is where the change took place of who we are. Verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his, his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Again, that word practice is the key. If you take this chapter and you go through these verses and you don't grasp practice, you're going to miss the heart of it. You will miss it. It's that practice. Because his seed abides in us, because that seed of that Holy Spirit abides in us, we don't practice sin. We can't. Never thought of that. We actually can't because our consciences prevent us from it. And we're all, we all can say this with full sincerity that, yeah, when I start down this road of sin, my conscience attacks me. No, it really wasn't your conscience. Do you realize it was the Holy Spirit that did that? He stepped in and said, you don't want to do that. If you do, you're going to feel bad. You want to feel bad or you want to feel good? Oh, well, that's kind of an easy choice. I don't want to feel bad. Nobody likes to feel bad. I want to feel good. So I, I, I'm not going to go down that road. Again, not forced, but my desire. My desire changed. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. You cannot continually practice sin, continually practice going down these roads, 
because that Holy Spirit is within you, your desire is to not practice this. But your desire is to practice righteousness. It changes, like I said, that whole word practice. I don't ever I never saw that in this context before. And like I said, it opened my eyes to a whole host of passages throughout all of Scripture that suddenly I understood, and now the clarity is much greater. It just changes it. Because, let's face it, sin is the natural way of life for the lost. It's their nature. It's how they live. It's natural. But for the child of God, it is unnatural. See, we're the distinct group. Sinning is not natural for us anymore. It's unnatural. We fight against it because it doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. Because it's not natural. It's no longer who we are. Verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. You see how he's kind of bringing it to a conclusion here? Stop and look at the world, the people you know, and it becomes obvious. Those who practice sin are of this world. Those who practice righteousness are children of God. We don't know the hearts of other people. But we do know the actions of other people and what inspires them, what makes them do what they do. And we can see it. Completely no, but to a very large extent, we can. Because we can see those that are practicing righteousness and those that are practicing lawlessness. And the world practices lawlessness. And there's this distinct group of which we are part of that practice righteousness. And then it ends with a cute little line because this is John. Okay, this is so distinct of John. Nor the one who does not love his brother. That fits in. It's known as part of everything all along. But John, being who John is, he had to write that line. Because it is, this is the bottom line of demonstration of abiding. We love each other. We demonstrate that by our practice. The way we practice our relationships with one another is through that concept of love. John wants us to clearly see that. And why? Because of the fact that it's so clear to us how we can love each other that it gives us a little glimpse into how God loves us. Because we start grasping that word a little more, a little better, a little clearer. So let me tell you this. If you struggle with sin, it is not a sign you're lost, it's a sign you're saved. Never thought of that before, have you? At least I didn't. A sign that I'm saved is the fact that I struggle with sin? Yes. Because remember one thing, okay? I don't know if any of you have ever thought this through before, but you're in your car, you're driving down I-40, and 70 miles an hour, so you're being good, you're actually doing the speed limit, okay? What part of the car is not moving? What well, even works with the truck? No, that's moving down the road at 70 miles an hour. That's moving down the road at 70 miles an hour. But there's one part that doesn't move. The part of the tire that's touching the road. But that part of the tire that's touching the road is not moving, because if it was, it'd be squealing all the way. Never thought about that before. See, that's that hold, that fix. See, we're the car. We're going through life at 70 miles an hour. God is that part of the tire that's touching the road. Immovable. But he's always with us.